Where are we now? We have made it. Congratulations, everyone. Give yourself a, an applause because you have now made it to what? Week six. You've been dreading this week, haven't you? I just want to make very, very clear what's going to happen in the next four weeks. Here's what's going to happen. Number one, number one, there's going to be a little bit more freestyle in the way I deliver information in the lecture and the workshop. However, I will make it very, very clear what is going to be in the exam and what is not. So you, so then you have clarity on that, okay? Clarity on what's in the exam, okay? Put your hand up if you think that is a good idea. Uh, only some of you, okay, all right, good. Number two, sometimes you will not see an exercise that I go through one by one by one by one by one as Mason has taken you through. She is very, very good at that, very methodical and never misses a step, okay? So she is very smart and her style of teaching is very, very good for that and prepares you for the midterm test and prepares you very, very well for the final exam. So that's number two, okay? I'm not going to be like that. Part of the way I teach is to try and inspire you to understand why do I need to know what I'm teaching, okay? Because if you, if you understand the why, you'll work out the how. Working out the how is very easy, okay? So I don't wanna just focus only on the how. So here we are now, we're in week six. I'm gonna take you through to week seven, eight and nine and then Mason is going to come back in week 10 and week 11. Okay, a lot of the content for today is directed at your strategy map game. You know the strategy map? Have you all visited your organization yet? Put your hand up if you have nominated your organization and you've made a list, okay? Hands up, any of you have been rejected? Anyone been rejected yet? <coughs> hands up, if you have been rejected, can I have a show of hands, please? Okay, if you haven't been rejected yet, thank you, Tom, then you're not trying hard enough. Okay, okay. get out there on the weekend and find your business. Okay, because you will have fun. Once you get over this, this uncertainty, this anxiety, that will make you stronger for the job interview. That will make you much stronger. We, you have to get out there. Okay, week six. Today I want to take you through week six. Now, there's content. There are four learning objectives that we want to focus on. The first three we'll cover in today's lecture. Okay, so make a note. Chapter 12, learning objectives one, two, and three is the, is the plan for today. Learning objective number four is the plan for Thursday. So you come on Thursday, learning objective four, we'll go through on Thursday, and it's likely there may be an exam question on learning objective four, okay? So the workshop on Thursday is gonna be very useful for that, all right? What am I talking about? I'm talking about Learning objective one, two, and three, that is what we are covering today. Is everyone clear on where we're going? Okay, chapter 12 of Horngren, learning objective three, okay. Okay, before we get started, in week one, I introduced you to the strategy map and the balanced scorecard and there's some videos, okay? I'm going to check in on your plan just to remind you what questions do you ask in the interview? You only need to ask a few questions. You just want to get some idea about what is their biggest challenge and that how well are you measuring any of these areas? Maybe they're not at all. Maybe there's a story of why they're not doing it. 
then that's a story too that you can write about and talk about. No business is too small for you not to write a project on. Okay? All right? But what is important is when you talk to a real business, you grow and your presentation makes a big difference. Okay? Are there any questions on this? Remember my consultation hours on Thursday, Wednesday, three o'clock to six o'clock. You're most welcome to come and see me, especially as a group, if you want clarification on your company visit. Okay, here I want to start you off with some videos. And the videos, most of these videos I show you are not on YouTube, okay? So I don't want to waste your time showing what you can already see in your own time. These are videos that I just reserve for my teaching. So what have we got here? We've got two businesses here. And these are two suppliers in China. They're both making money, but they have a different business model. They have a different strategy. Okay, week six is about strategy. This one at the top, is making millions of dollars of inventory and then just waits for the customer orders to come in. And as you go through this video, you'll see me later, I'll show you, I will show you how, see all that inventory here? It's just boxes stacked there waiting for orders to come in. This one here is making these USB drives to order. When a customer when you order 2,000 or 3,000, then they'll make it for you. So they'll make after the customer order comes in. They are making before the customer order comes in. Two different business models, they're both making money. This company at the bottom is doing over 3 million US dollars in revenue every year by selling USB drives. And some of those USB drives don't even work how can they make money? Because they sell to associations, they sell to corporates, they sell to people that give them away as gifts. If you were to get a USB drive as a gift and find it doesn't work, are you going to complain? Probably not. That's a good business model. Making money, all right? The one at the top is making money too. They are selling to all the car manufacturers in China. And when the order comes in, they ask for a particular software to fit their car, and so they unpack the VCR player or the video player, and then install the software and then send it off to the customer. Different strategies for different companies. I just want to, I want you to think deeply. When you are visiting a company and you're talking to the owner, just because they are one of a hundred restaurants in Geo or Sunway, it doesn't mean they have exactly the same business model. Just like not all Chinese factories are the same. Every factory has a different business model. Okay, don't believe what they say in the newspaper about China. See it for yourself. That's what I do. I don't trust half of what they talk about China and Bloomberg or in the newspaper, okay? I've been up there for 19 years and I just want to see for myself how are these factories making money? And what I, here's one thing I can tell you, they all have a different strategy. They're all different. All the restaurants that you see around here, they're all different. They all look, you all think, oh, they're all serving food, oh, they must have the same strategy, no. Okay, you go and find out, okay? Get intrigued by, wow, tell, so tell me about your strategy. Oh, do you think it's different from your competitors? Oh, no, it's the same. Oh, in what way is it the same? And then they tell you about their competitor. Wow, that's interesting. Show an interest, okay? That's when your learning starts, when you see differences between businesses. If every business is was the same, let's be clear here, if every business is the same, makes the same money the same way, has the same customer, we don't need to have this lecture. 
We don't need to have this contact. I don't need to teach you anything. Okay? I want you to find out that the businesses, when you dig deeper and you talk to real business owners, you see that they have their own unique way. They have their own unique strategy. And you won't get that by reading the newspaper. You won't get that by reading the web. That's what today is about. Today is about the uniqueness of strategies. Now, as I've just shown you here, yes, businesses are unique. And in week one, I explained to you about strategic responsibility set systems. And I'll briefly cover these again. And some of you will probably think, oh, do I have to come to the lecture? OK, this will help you just to reinforce, especially for your major project, OK, and especially for the exam. So this is good reinforcement, OK? So let's uh, have a look at what I'm going to do as I take you through what is different about today. And week one is I'm going to show you real videos and real live footage to support different points. We didn't have time to do that in week one. As you know, the balance scorecard, we're going to cover that. I'm just showing you some things that you are familiar with. So the word learning objective one, strategy, how do firms succeed? How do they succeed? Okay. When you read chapter 12, what you realize is, oh, chapter 12 puts organizations in the buckets. They put them into one type of strategy, another type of strategy. Okay, so why do we do that? So we can start to learn about differences. If I told you that there was 1,000 different strategies, you couldn't absorb or comprehend. But if I was to tell you there's three different distinct generic strategies, then you can start to absorb the differences. And then when you go out and meet businesses, you actually find, oh, this third strategy, oh, there's another 10 different variations of that. Oh, this first strategy, there's another 10 variations of that. Oh, O'Connor, why didn't you tell me about that? Look, I can only, we've got to start somewhere, right? We've got to start somewhere. And so that's what we're doing today, okay? So how do firms succeed? Here's the next question. What do you mean by success? And I could ask you, name some successful firms. And every firm has to have a plan that will lead to success. So the first company I showed you before, their plan was just to make inventory. They had, let me give you, is this management accounting, cost accounting? Mason talked about cost accounting, right? And Last year, you learned about cost accounting, am I right? You did. Nod, please. Am I in the right class? I hope so. Okay, that first organization, they had over a million US dollars of inventory in the hallways. You saw it as we walked through. Did you know the cost of holding that inventory works out to about 25% per year? That's $250,000 per year of just holding that inventory that you don't sell. We're going to talk more about that in week nine. Okay, And these are real ways in which you can help organizations improve their cost management. Ah, wow. Can you, can you be a consultant? Sure you can. Some of you can be a consultant already with your project. Anything is possible. Anyone can be a consultant, anyone that gives an advice, gives advice. And I told you what to do. Basically, if someone asks you for advice, you just say, oh, why do customers buy from you? Ah, that's all. That's your starting point. That's all you have to ask. Okay, so here are some successful firms. How many of you know this, this company here? Come on, yell it out. What's the name of this company? Hello? You don't know this one? HTC. Don't you know HTC? Like Apple and Samsung are not the only phone companies in the world. All right? PQI. 
I visited those companies over five years ago in Taiwan, and I had the, I had the pleasure of going through and looking at all their manufacturing. HTC manufacturing facilities five, six years ago was more advanced than Samsung's or Apple's. Amazing. More advanced than Foxcom, who is the manufacturer for Apple. I know that because I've seen their operations. All right, here are some other successful firms in Hong Kong. Here are some in China. How many of you know this one? Alibaba. How, you know Alibaba? Do you know Lazada? Lazada? Do you, put your hand up if you buy from Lazada. Okay, do you know who owns Lazada? Who owns Lazada? Who owns Lazada? Who, who actually owns that company? Do you know? Would you be surprised if I said it was Alibaba? Yeah. Cool. All right, Alibaba's in Malaysia already. Wow. Okay, so how, remember I told you there are lots and lots of strategies, okay? Lots and lots, I'm not gonna tell you everyone, but if we were to break it down into three different types of strategies, we could say that one strategy is to make products that are different from other competitors. And the other strategy is, well, let's make sure we make the product for the least price possible and sell it for the lowest price. Ah, and this, if you watch all the news on China, you think that, oh, all Chinese companies do is just do this all the time. That is, they make millions of volume and then sell it for the lowest price and just sell it wherever they can. And if they can't sell it in USA, they send it to Lazada and sell it in Malaysia. Maybe not. No, it's a little bit more differentiated than that. There are factories in China that have a product differentiation strategy and I'll show you that today. Okay, so here are the two big strategies. Generic strategies we would like you to introduce to you. So here are two companies now. Okay, what do we have here? Let's be very clear. Here are two more factories in China. Let's see what their strategies are and are they different? Oh, this is patience. She is uh, got green glasses, so when you see her in the factory, you know it's the same. They make, they make speakers that are about one third the price of Aoni. Aoni, they make an ANC speakers, that is automatic noise cancellation speakers. Amazing, high-end speakers. So the FOB of this one ranges from 18 to 38.50. FOB means free on board on the ship, so if you buy 1,000 to sell in Lazada, then you have to pay 1,000 times this to the manufacturer in China, and then you ship it to Malaysia and then sell it online. Are you with me? So FOB is the price you pay the factory to get it to the port in Hong Kong or Shenzhen, wherever you are shipping it from. Ah, and so this one here, the, these headphones here, are only $6.50 FOB. And so the general rule, if you want to sell it on Lazada or make money online selling, you want to sell whatever good you're buying for at least four times the FOB price, okay? Now that, my job today is not to promote selling online, okay? That's another course I teach. But my job today is just to show you one company here that is more like a cost leadership strategy and this company here is more of a product differentiation strategy. Ah. Wow, okay, so I've got a question for you. Do the factory that supplies this headphone, is it different from the factory that supplies this headphone? Put your hand up if you think yes. Hands up for yes. Hands up for no. Sorry, I want participation here, especially up the back. Okay? I'm watching you. Okay? And I love you. Thank you for coming too. Really appreciate this. Okay? After all the bad things that have been said about me in the last five weeks. Okay. So, here's my question to you. And ready? I want it. Honest hands up for one or the other. Is the factory that makes these headphones different from the factory that makes these headphones? 
Hands up if you think the factories are different. Okay? Hands up if you think the factories are the same. Okay? More hands. Oh, interesting. Hands up if you would like to see for yourself. You don't, never trust what professor says. I want you to see with your very own eyes. Okay? Are you ready? Let's have a look at the two factories. Okay? Okay, so now we go to the exact same factories, okay? All right, so we have uh, one fa the top factory here, 650 FOB, and then we have Aoni. Aoni, this is the other factory, okay? The design house, that may be the same in both factories, what they do on the software, but now let's go into the assembly area and see if the factories are different. Remember, today's lecture is about strategy and seeing different strategies that companies follow. Okay, that's what today is about. So look at this. Do you think the factory is the same or different? Hands up if you think it's different. Ah. Hands up if you, which one do you think is the more expensive factory? The one at the top? The one at the bottom? Ah, so now you know Maybe both factories are making the same amount of money because the cost of manufacturing is definitely higher here. Look at this. And I've been to this company twice. And the second time, when I went there, they said, oh, sorry, you're not allowed a video. I said, sorry, the professor doesn't come if he cannot video. And they said, oh, okay, we'll allow you to video, but we will tell you what you can and cannot video. So I had to negotiate with them. But this is very hard to go into the factory and then you video s secret stuff, you know? And I said, I'm using it for my teaching because I want students to see the real thing that media cannot show you, okay? So look at that. Two strategies, two different factories. Put your hand up if you see, if you learned something from this video. Hands up. Okay? All right? See for yourself. Don't always trust what the professor tells you, okay? All right? D big difference. And both of these companies are making money. Both of them. And uh, this is what was interesting for this one here when I went through. Notice how they're lined up here. And they said to me, oh, please don't video on the other side where they actually do the testing where they take the ANC headphones, they take it into a studio and they test all the dimensions. I said, sorry, you cannot video that. That's our secret. That's our secret source. But, ah, wow, interesting. But I saw it and I could tell you it was there. All right, so if you go into a shop, maybe you see different products at different price ranges. So you have the ordinary camera, your waterproof camera. By the way, this is Hong Kong dollars, I apologize. I'll have to change it to Malaysian ringgit, but it's so easy now because the Malaysian ringgit is now worth two Hong Kong dollars, okay? So you just halve it, get the idea, okay? Uh, they're, they're the prices of uh, cameras in Hong Kong. And so you can go to a low range or high range. Obviously, once you get up to here, customers, why do they buy the camera? They ask many more questions. And so if you want a product differentiate in this range here, you need to be very, very, very clear on your technology, very clear on your specifications. Why? Because customers want to know everything. Ah, whereas down here, well, you know, do you really care if one camera is 10 grams lighter than the other one? Do the customers care? I don't know, all right? Because the price point is different. And so, depending on the different product group you are trying to sell to, companies might have a focusing strategy. Ah, so you may find that like Canon, Nikon, Leica, you know, they really focus on the high-end cameras. Ah, whereas you've got a, a greater range of manufacturers that are selling down here. Ah, so that's what we mean by focusing strategy, all right? So, how do firms succeed? So now, let me just summarize the first learning point is, 
understand that companies have different strategies. But chapter 12 just wants you to just understand three types of strategies. Okay? Cost leadership, product differentiation, and focusing. What I have shown you are examples of two factories where one is more like a cost leadership and another one is much more of a product differentiator. Ah, wow. Okay, so that's your first thing to take away from the last 15 minutes. Okay, the next, are we all clear on that, where we are? Now the next thing I want you to take away, the next new idea, and this will help you in your presentation for the strategy map exercise. And that is this notion of the customer preference map. This is a little bit old, but we could get an update on this. At one point in time, if we go back over 10 years, Apple was trying to compete only in the plus 500 US dollar market. And they have stayed there. So in some ways, Apple was a differentiator, but also it's very focused. Are you with me here? Whereas if you look at Nokia, they were selling products into all different ranges. Now, Nokia now has just been bought out by Microsoft and basically no longer exists in its brand name at all. Gone. It failed. Nokia failed to transition. It failed to pivot when Apple came along. Okay? Whereas HTC, HTC, did you know... HTC was the first to adopt Android in the phone system. Did you know that? Not Samsung. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. No, 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 no. No, Google, they were looking for a manufacturer to actually prototype and actually sell their Android system back in 19, sorry, 2007. And what they wanted, they went to Samsung, they went to Nokia, and Samsung and Nokia said, oh, it's going to take 18 months. They went to HTC, and HTC said, oh, we can do this in seven months. Wow. And guess what Google, guess who Google cho chose? They chose HTC. So HTC was the first to have Android. Why? Because HTC guaranteed Google that they could bring it out within seven months. And that's what they did, first to market. All right? In, in week nine, we're going to be talking about first to market. Ah, okay. So here is another, this is from, how many of you are interested in becoming an analyst, a research analyst? Anyone? You don't? You don't want to make bucket loads of money? Oh, okay. No one want to work for Google's? Uh, sorry, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse. You don't want to work for any of them? No, good idea. All right. So what we got here is this is an analyst report from Credit Suisse on the different phone manufacturers. And it's kind of like an analyst report of the industry. And this is a bit dated, but I just want to show you that if you are an analyst for a particular industry, you will go through an analytical exercise where you will benchmark all the different players. And you will weight them based on some kind of scorecard. <gasps> scorecard? Really? They really do that? Outside of chapter 12 in Horngren? Yes, they do. It's real. Look, that's an analyst report. Ah, but this is a different type of scorecard. This is more like a customer preference map type scorecard. In other words, we're mapping out or waiting why customers buy Apple compared to why do they buy Nokia, why do they buy Motorola, why do they buy Samsung. And so the highest rating to Apple was given to its software and brand. The highest rating to Samsung was given to, can I follow that across? Was given to the brand, but also they were very high on the distribution and supply chain, you see? So each of these players had different weightings on why customers buy their product. Ah, I showed you that in week one. What did I show you? What was that first video? Why do customers buy from you? 
Ah, oh, really? Analysts do that too. They find out what do customers prefer? What is their preference for a particular one particular product over another one? Okay, people do that in real industries. Wow. So let's have a look at chipset. Chipset is a real example in chapter 12, and we're going to follow chipset through in more detail in on Thursday. Hmm. A little bit more number crunching on Thursday. So get ready for that. I need to get ready for that too. So I'm just preparing myself. But this is what a customer preference map would look like. It's possible for your, for your presentation of your company strategy, okay, for your assignment to do something like this, a customer preference map. Okay? If you have time, if you've got the information to compare, so one of you, who's, who's doing a sunflower restaurant? Sunflower coffee. Come on, someone's doing that. Hello? Anyone home? Someone wrote down sunflower coffee. Am I right? You wrote it down in Google Sheets. Okay, it's down there. Okay. Anyway, maybe if you got into conversation with them, you ask, oh, why do customers come to you? And part of that is, why do they come to you versus going to Old Town Coffee versus going to the Banana Leaf Coffee versus going to like the other coffee places that are next door? Are you with me here? Do they know that? Do they know that they have a distinct reason for why customers come to them? That would be good to know if I was the business person. I need to be unique. That's the only way I can survive in the long term. Ah, so this is what this map is all about. It is about mapping the uniqueness of your product or service offering versus what a competitor's uniqueness is. Just knowing how you are different from your competitor. That's what a customer preference map is. And so if you were to present something like that in your strategy map as part of your report, then that is useful too. Okay? It's possible that you may be asked to do a customer preference map in the exam. Let me explain very briefly. If chipset has a high rating on price, that means customers customers prefer chipset over Visilog because chipset provides better value for money. If chipset ranks lower on customized chip design, that means customers come to chipset because chipset makes a more of a generic product and their main competitor makes a more unique customized product. So that's what a customer preference map means. Okay, number two, customer preference map. Okay. So in chapter 12, we have a, let's have a break at three o'clock. Are you, we have a break at three o'clock, is that okay? Can you last another 10 minutes? Are you sure? All right, okay. All right, so I can dance if you need me to. Now, learning objective one is understanding custom preference map. A customer preference map is kind of like a map of what is unique about the strategy. Let me repeat, a customer preference map is like a map of what is unique about the company's strategy. So according to this customer preference map, chipset, we can, this is not working, we can see that chip, which one of these companies do you think is more of a cost leader? Which one is more of a differentiator? Okay, which one is more like a, 
a, here's my question, and I'll, I'm looking for a hand response, okay? Which one of these companies looks more like a cost leadership strategy? Hands up for Chipset, hands up for Visilog. Okay, why would you say Visilog is more of a cost leadership strategy? Because you think that the price is lower, is that why? Okay, what I want to, some of you may think that, but when it says the price is lower, no, that doesn't mean the price is lower. That means that customers rate, they underweight the price factor when they're buying from Visilog. You with me here? They overweight the price factor when they're buying from Chipset. In other words, they buy from Chipset because Chipset has better value for the price. Ah, you see? So this is a map from the customer perspective. A higher rating on price means you're more like a cost leader. A lower rating on price means you're more like a differentiator. For example, Apple iPhone, how much is an iPhone now? How, come on, how much? 4,500 ringgit. You've got to be kidding. Wow. I can get 8,000 Hong Kong dollars in Hong Kong. It's cheaper. That's all right. Okay. All right. There's not much difference. Uh, you know, across all the countries in Asia, the iPhone is only about 10% difference between the highest and the lowest. So it's okay. Not worth going to Hong Kong to get a 10% discount. Okay. So Apple would be here. Okay. And you know. What's some of the local brands? What about Xiaomi? Do they sell Xiaomi in Malaysia? Xiaomi is very big. You know Xiaomi is a $60 billion company now in China. It's huge. Okay, uh, Vivo is another one, right? Okay, so Xiaomi, Vivo, they're over here. Why? Because customers, customers go there to buy their product because they are of a lower price point. It's one of the factors that customers pay more attention to. Okay, so the big takeaway is the customer preference map is basically we're rating the attribute. This is not a rating of low price to high price. This is a rating of why you buy that product. Ah, that's what I want you to take away. So next, learning objective is value. So here is chipset. Customer preference map, decide on cost leadership strategy. They are a cost leadership strategy. And then if they're going to have a cost leadership strategy, then they need to build internal capabilities to achieve cost leadership. They need to do that. And how can they do that? Well, then we value engineering, process engineering. This is funny because in week nine, we're going to talk about that again. Week 12 kind of talks about things in other chapters. We, but, oh, let me help you. In week nine, we're looking at chapter 13. Okay, chapter 13 of Horngren, okay? So in chapter 13, we could talk a little bit that, about this in more detail. But it is learning objective two in chapter 12, so we need to cover it. Learning objective two, you need to understand what do we mean by value engineering process engineering. And so, let me give you a, an idea what we mean by engineering. I think this is worth, oh. Okay, in week nine, I will brief you, in, I will introduce you to these four concepts. Let's just get this out here. Okay, in week nine, we will actually come back and look at one, two, three, and four. In week, in week six, where we are today, and we're, oh, sorry, we're gonna look at this in week eight, chapter 13. In chapter 12, when chapter 12 refers to re-engineering, chapter 12 is referring to number three here, process innovation, okay? 
That's all. Chapter 12 is not focusing on 1, 2, and 4 so much, more on making, making radical changes. And so when we talk about re-engineering, I just want to show you what does engineering look like in the factory. Okay, so let's have a look here. All right, so here is a machine. This machine here does the work of three people. So one person operates a machine and they re can replace three people. So that's what we mean by re-engineering. Are you with me here, class? All right. And down here, here is another machine that is doing the work of three people, but one person has to operate the machine. So when we talk about factories really getting involved in automation, this is more semi-automation. Because semi-automation means that a person still needs to stand there and operate the machine. But it's still re-engineering. You are still replacing people with processes. And this is where a lot of factories in China are at at the moment, that just putting in semi-automated machinery. So that's when, in chapter 12, when they say, oh, chipset can start to do re-engineering. So here is one example. They could put in these machines and start to replace people with these machines. Okay? Good, you see for yourself. You see what we mean by engineering, okay? All right, let me give you another example. Class, remember this is learning objective two. We're talking about re-engineering, okay? Here is another example of re-engineering and I, wanna sh I want you to tell me which company do you think is the one that has adopted re-engineering and has adopted an automated process approach to manufacturing? They're both intensive, but which one do you think is more automated? Which one do you think has re-engineered its process? Are you ready? Okay, so pay attention, let's have a look. Wouldn't it be good if you had an exam like this, you need to pick A and B, you get it wrong or you get it right, right? Okay, so let's have a good, okay? By the way, what are they making? What are they making? Come on! You don't know? Hoverboards, yes, we all love them. The US government loved them in 2016, they banned them. No hoverboards were allowed to be shipped to China until, sorry, lift, shipped from China into the US until, until the factories got a UL standard. UL, that's Underwriters Laboratory, that is a certification company out of Canada that certifies the electrics of various products that are coming out of factories. So if you want to be certified, they come visit the factory and make sure you have all the processes in place. Ah, so one of these companies was able to be UL certified. Which one? Hands up for the bottom one. Hands up for the top one. Yes, you got it. It's so easy when you see for yourself. Okay, now when I went to this factory here, they were making 600 hoover boards on the day I visited this factory. 600. They weren't making it for a US customer. Remember, it's banned, all right? But they told me, oh, that doesn't matter. There's another 150 countries around the world we can ship to. <laughs> Serious. It doesn't matter. This, this company is still going. Guess which country they were sending their Hoover boards to. They were sending them to France. 600 order. Just like that. Boom. This operator here makes the Hoover board from scratch. Everything. So, screws in all the different parts, wheels on everything, just all himself. This one here, they have the planto grown and the full manufacturing, and they have, about, they have about 35 people around this assembly line, but each person just does one task. Ah, which person do you think is smarter? Which person do you think is more intelligent with regard to the hoverboard manufacturer? The one at the bottom or the one at the top? Hands up for the bottom, hands up for the top. Okay, the one at the bottom is smarter. Because they need to know every one of those 90 processes that
that need to be go through to make the hoverboard. The one at the top, each person only needs to do one or two things, and then the hoverboard goes to the next stage. Ah. So with this re-engineering here, it's easier to hire someone and teach them within six hours about what to do and then put them on the assembly line. Because this company is more of a workshop, it relies very heavily on the heavy skills of one person. If that person leaves, it can stop the production altogether. Ah, very high risk. So this is why companies are re-engineering. They re-engineer to reduce the risk of turnover in the labour. They re-engineer to reduce the labour costs. In the previous video, they put a machine in and replaced three people with one person. Ah, that's what re-engineering is about. And look, here is our here is our tester. I cannot believe that here is the quality control guy. And that's what he does all day. And he just goes anywhere. Whereas this company had a special room for testing the hoverboard. All right? And so there he is there. Look at that. Just crazy. He's, that's QC. Oh, don't worry, next week we're going to look at QC in a little bit more detail. I'll show you some more interesting videos. Okay, so basically you need to go up a 10% gradient and down. I think that's a 30% gradient. And then you need to go into the wall and it needs to be able to stop and then come back out. And so there are different processes they go through with the QC. All right, so what I want to show you the takeaway is the engineering that you need to be aware of. Okay, so that's, there's another video of me actually on the hoverboard, but we won't show you that now. Okay, so, um, so we're going to have a break now, but what, what have we done in the last hour? Number one, I've introduced to you two learning objectives. The first one, strategy, and the best way to, best way to pitch a strategy is in the form of a customer preference map. The second idea I introduced to you in the last hour is this idea of re-engineering where it's what do you do if you want to change things, if you want to reduce costs, if you want to meet the budget like May Sin has been teaching you. Well, you need to do re-engineering. Well, what is that? I showed you some videos of what factories are doing for re-engineering. So have a break. When we come back, we're going to go back into the balance scorecard like we did in week one, and I'll repeat some of those ideas. So thank you, and see you in about, I'll give you 10 minutes. Okay.